of psychedelic uh, therapeutics and um, history. Uh, Matt is an associate professor at the John Hopkins School of Medicine, uh, which I think it's safe to say is pretty much the preeminent uh, psychedelic research center in the world at this point. As you probably heard, they recently raised $17 million in new funding, which has enabled them to do a lot of good and now a lot of chairs. Uh, Matt personally has supervised over 100 psychedelic assisted therapy sessions. He's published over 100 peer reviewed papers and chapters. A third of them have been on the subject of psychedelics. And uh, he's going to be telling us what's up right now. So please give a very warm round of applause to Dr. Matt Johnson. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's an honor to speak before you, and I appreciate the society putting this on. You know, whenever I come to a, a psychedelic meeting, there's like one big question that I'm asking myself about the audience. It's like, do I do the jokes or do I not do the jokes? <laughs> and so I wasn't quite sure this morning, but then when I saw Adam's, you know, introduction, I was like, okay, we're doing the jokes. All right, so, so the way this works is, well, I'll just go into my first one. Okay, so a guy buys a pair of shoes from his drug dealer. Don't ask me why he's buying shoes from his drug dealer. It was just a good deal. But he tells me, it's like he was complaining. It's like, I don't know what they were laced with, but I was tripping all day. <laughs> And then, as it, as it turns out, you know, what kind, you know what kind of shoes they were, right? High heels. <laughs> so, so, so that joke came from Wendy Feng, and she, I, gave some, I uh, told some jokes at a meeting in Switzerland earlier this summer. At the end of that talk, she said, nice jokes, but here's a better one. She gave me that one. And uh, then I used the joke I just told you at a recent meeting in Berlin, and then somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, I've got one, I've got a joke. So it was a visual joke, so he got my, my phone number and texted me, so I'll just show you. It takes a second to, to digest. I'll just let you read it. <laughs> yeah, I, you get a little giggle from the count, and then when you really get to the bottom, then you really get it. Yeah, the infinity. One, two, three, infinity, oh no. It will never end. So, so that's the way this works. It's a tradition I've started the last few meetings. You know, I'm hoping to get one or two jokes from someone at this meeting after this talk so I can kind of use that one at, uh, at the next time I talk somewhere. So uh, I want to start well, I've already started with the jokes, but the next thing I'm getting to is acknowledgments. So I'm going to try to get through um, a, a, a brief bird's eye summary of work that we've conducted at Johns Hopkins for nearly 20 years on psilocybin and other psychedelics. I've been uh, a part of this group for 15 years myself. Um, so what I'm going to show you is a product of many people. I've surely forgotten many people off of this list, but these are at least the biggies. Too many people to call out, but I'll call out Roland Griffiths, Mary Cosimano, Al Garcia, Fred Barrett. Um, funding uh, from a number of great organizations, including Hefter Research Institute. Um, check out our website, hopsinpsychedelic.org. And I'll tell you about some recent news we announced about two weeks ago. Um, uh, the, the world's largest psychedelic research center. We received some, after hobbling along for many years, we've received a significant sum of funding uh, uh, to conduct a large number of studies funded by the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation and the Tim Ferriss Collaborative. We're going to be doing uh, studies all look, using psilocybin and uh, looking for treatment of opioid addiction, PTSD, some fMRI work looking at treatment of people with both alcoholism and depression, so you know, people with both those disorders. Anorexia, depression within Alzheimer's disease, that's early Alzheimer's. 
And mood symptoms associated with post-treatment Lyme disease, what's formerly known as chronic Lyme disease syndrome, microdosing of, of psychedelics and healthy normals, and also uh, the effects of high-dose psilocybin on creativity. And then we're going to have a, a, a genetics and biomarkers core across all of these studies to really dig in with some large, uh, uh, large sample sizes to uh, learn more about predictors and correlates of change. So, and I, I will say now that what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm timing myself. I'm going to stop at 50 minutes, and hopefully that leaves us time for some questions and answers. But I'll ask you to hold um, questions until that time. So, psilocybin. I'll, I'll go th quickly through the stuff I think you've gotten a great review of today. But many species of mushrooms. It's a classic psychedelic in the same classes LSD, mescaline, uh, dimethyltryptamine, uh, substantially different than other drugs sometimes called psychedelics like MDMA um, or the NMDA antagonists like ketamine. Some overlap, but these drugs, by and large, what you say about one is largely true of the other ones. Uh, difficult to come up with a great definition. It's interesting, uh, uh, very similar to the quote by Jaffe that Dave gave earlier from Goodman and Gilman. But this one is um, Lester Grinspoon's, a drug which, without causing physical addiction, craving major physiological disturbance, delirium, disorientation, or amnesia, more or less reliably produces thought, mood, and perceptual changes, otherwise rarely experienced except in dreams, contemplative and religious exaltation, flashes of vi vivid involuntary memory, and acute psychosis. It's a mouthful, um, complex effects that often de defy description. We do know that the serotonin 2A uh, receptor seems to play a, a primary role in these effects. We know that through drug discrimination, which Dave explained earlier. We know that antagonizing or blocking the effects of this receptor will block both the effects on drug discrimination and other uh, models in non-humans and also the subjective effects in humans. We know serotonin 2A affinity. Uh, or how much the, the, the compound is sticking to that receptor. It's correlated with human potency. Dave mentioned this earlier, but this is uh, one of the early demonstrations of that type of correlation between receptor affinity and, and, and the dose that you need to get a psychedelic effect in, um, in people. So uh, in terms of you know, coming up with the compounds used for these types of correlations, um, of course, Dave Nichols that we've heard from, also Sh Sasha Shulgin or Alexander Shulgin, which Dave referred to, uh, author of Peak, Hal, and Tickle. And you, if you haven't read these books and you're at this meeting, you, you should read those books um, tomorrow. Uh, it's a photo with the first time I visited Sasha's lab. I'd been doing psychedelic research for about three years in 2007 at that point. Um, so he deserves a lot of credit. I think uh, it's going to take us hundreds of years to you know, fully do all of the human work, you know, plowing through this library of compounds that we have. And we're just kind of touching the surface on these first few compounds in clinical development. So an absolutely ancient uh, and, and prehistoric history of use uh, of these compounds, including psilocybin mushrooms, dating back to hundreds and even a few thousand years in Meso in South America, but then about 10,000 years ago um, from cave paintings uh, in northern Africa. So you know, that predates the earliest um, human civilizations in Mesopotamia by several thousand years, so absolutely prehistoric. Fast forwarding quite a bit of time from the 40s through 70s, they were really, um, these compounds were investigated as research tools and therapeutics. Dave Gray gave a great overview of like how, how critical the discovery of LSD was at that time at, of our emerging understanding of how the brain functions. Uh, promising clinical findings, I'd say the most promising were for cancer-related distress and alcoholism, and th these were both using LSD primarily. And then there were the dark ages, so yeah, you can see my guy being crucified up there, hanging over the town square. Um, despite uh, pr promising preliminary findings, human research became virtually dormant for decades. And the important thing to note is that this really was a reaction to the association of LSD with the 60s counterculture. And there were definitely some casualties. 
um, but there was well conducted research um, that mitigated the risks in good laboratory research back in those days. Um, so it really wasn't this like sober evaluation of the risk benefit profile when safely conducted that led to the hiatus. It was more of the association with the counterculture. But to be clear, there are definitely risks. I referred you to a recent paper that I published with colleagues um, about anticipating the potential approval of psilocybin, hopefully within the next uh, you know, five years or so. You know, what schedule should it be moved into based on a review of the evidence? And our conclusion was that um, it would, uh, if it stays in the Controlled Substances Act, it deserves more to be in Schedule 4 based on the data. But, but the, the known harms are these, um, and, and this is largely true of the other classic psychedelics like LSD as well, but this was focused on psilocybin. It, it, this can cause harm in people with psychosis or predisposition for psychosis. For anybody, it can cause fear, panic, confusion, um, a so-called bad trip that can potentially lead to dangerous behavior. And most of the time when people have these reactions, they're not hurt, but sometimes they definitely are um, out there in the wild. Um, psilocybin in particular can cause moderate elevations in pulse and blood pressure. Um, so um, that can be a problem for people at the more severe end of cardiovascular vulnerability. Uh, something we've documented uh, it, systematically is that psilocybin causes headaches in the day following uh, use, and here's the publication um, we put out on that one. Typically mild to moderate. Uh, it might also be a clue for understanding how psilocybin can treat cluster headaches. Far more work is to be, needs to be done in that area. Uh, and also there's this rare psychiatric uh, syndrome, hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder which is very mysterious. It's relatively rare in recreational use, but really, astonishingly, it seems to be exclusively associated with recreational use. So it's never been observed in either the older or current era of, of, of well uh, you know, screened and supervised sessions. So it could be a product of, of you know, really particular vulnerability, of impure drugs, uh, of, of polydrug use combination with alcohol and other drugs, which is um, so often the rule rather than the exception in recreational use. Um, but importantly, uh, a risk uh, dimension for a, a psychoactive drug, which is conspicuously not present, is there's no addiction. So to be clear, psilocybin and other classic psychedelics can be abused, and that just means they can be used dangerously. So, you know, we heard earlier driving on psilocybin, really bad idea, you know. <laughs> put yourself and others in danger, that's an obvious example. You can use it in a way that interferes with family relationships, you know, your work, et cetera. But these aren't drugs of addiction. No one is jonesing for their next psilocybin or LSD fix. You know, there's not, no compulsive drug seeking, and I've never seen a singular example of that. We know that at every level, the way these drugs work in the dopamine, mesolimbic brain reward system through large epidemiology studies, through reliable animal models of self-administration. Every level of science tells us this is a solid finding. So speaking of the, the so-called bad trips, our friend SpongeBob is demonstrating that here. In the lab, we actually refer to these more broadly as challenging experiences, because if they're, if they're in the safe confines of clinical research or in uh, potential approved uh, clinical use in the future, um, we've really mitigated those, those risks. And um, I should say, you know, in terms of that long list of, of potential harms in the last slide, importantly, every single one of them is squarely mitigated in clinical research. So that's what, you know, that's something very good to know, and it compares favorably to many things we do in medicine, I would argue, in that risk-benefit profile. But we, in terms of these challenging experiences, many people in clinical uh, studies claim that some of these like very difficult, sometimes the most frightening experiences of their life are also some of the most meaningful, and they are powerful learning experiences. That's not always the case, but we encourage a mindful, mindful approach where people um, accept all experiences, including the, the, the difficult ones, and move through them. And, and we developed the first so-called you know, challenging experience scale 
um, through both lab research and surveying thousands of people describing their um, difficult experiences. Part of that, uh, the mitigating factors is that safe set and setting, that um, environment with not only a pleasing uh, physical room, but also the interpersonal support that you see demonstrated there with a, a mock volunteer. Our earliest work looked at so-called healthy normals, people without nominal problems to fix, even though we all have our problems, diagnosable or not. Uh, we demonstrated that a high dose of psilocybin was safe in a structured setting, and remarkably, the psilocybin experience was rated among the five most meaningful life experiences for the majority of people. And we, we documented claimed improvements in mood and quality of life over a year after sessions. So not just from those individuals, but also their neighbors and spouses and coworkers that agreed to be part of the study that reported on the ongoing behavior of the, of the volunteers. And so we followed up the original study with a, comparing psilocybin to a control substance to um, follow that up with a, a dose effect study where we compared a placebo to 5, 10, 20 and 30 milligrams of psilocybin body weight adjusted. And we found that increasing psilocybin dose had an orderly effect on not just mystical experience, but also challenging experience and long-term positive attribution. So clearly it's not just pharmacology, the set and set is important, but you look at data like this and you see this just beautiful dose effect curve. Clearly there's some major pharmacology going on here under double blind conditions. Um, one of the, the the constructs that we've used repeatedly in our, in our studies is the so-called mystical experience. It, it can sound a little woo-woo, but it actually is divorced from any nominal religious or supernatural beliefs. It's a, um, a psychological construct that goes back to William James, the so-called uh, father of American psychology. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more in, in a few seconds on what constitutes that mystical experience. But about 60% of participants in both our first two studies with Healthy Normals met criteria for a so-called complete mystical experience involving a sense of unity, like feeling one with the universe, a noetic uh, quality, um, or a, like, a, like a self-validating quality to the experience, like it's somehow how more real than everyday life, a sense of sacredness, a sense of transcending time and space, positive mood, ineffability. And we've also developed the first validated scale to assess mystical experiences, specifically coming from drug or other acute manipulation. So we call this the NEQ 30. And, and the tradition of looking at these mystical experiences, one of the interesting components is that this didn't originate in drug research. This goes back to the observation that the reported religious and other extraordinary experiences throughout cultures, throughout the centuries from different languages, often have those core similar features like a sense of unity, etc. So the idea is that this might be something the human being does under circumstances that, it, you know, um, far more, I think we're really scratching our surface there with the mystical experience, but I'll tell you more about how we um, repeatedly find that it is predictive of um, long-term positive benefits. We found in combining our first two healthy normal studies with a larger sample that psilocybin led to an increase in the personality dimension openness on a validated uh, personality instrument, the NEO. Openness refers to a broad-minded tolerance for other people's points of view, the, idea, the ability to hold different points of view at the same time and, and view them as a, a both rather than an either or, um, an appreciation for aesthetics including art, and to our knowledge, this is still the first experimental study ever, like drugs or anything else, to actually change a personality dimension. I mean, the definition of personality is it's stable. It doesn't change. Um, and we know certain things, uh, you can change a personality dimension, like growing old by several decades, to, you know, on average changes, like it, that actually decreases openness, um, you know, getting older. So you can actually see perhaps psilocybin as a fountain of youth because it has the opposite <laughs> effect. And we found that it was driven not just by getting psilocybin or ratings of drug strength, but by driven by whether or not someone had that so-called mystical experience. So you can, hear, you can see here mapped out the openness scores 
pre to post and those who had the, the full mystical experience versus not with all of those domains met. And you really see it was the folks, it wasn't just getting psilocybin, it was the folks that had that type of experience that increased the, uh, that saw the increase in openness. So now I'll get into one of our therapeutic studies. This is our, our, our trial published in 2016 uh, with cancer patients. It was published so, a few years after our, our colleague Charlie Grobe's um, smaller study with a more moderate dose in cancer patients. And, and our study was published concurrently with our colleagues at New York University with a, using similar work with a similarly high dose. Our study used 51 patients. They all had life-threatening cancer. They had, about a third had a, a disorder involving depression, about a third a disorder involving anxiety, and about a third had both. Very briefly, the study design, everyone had two psilocybin sessions five weeks apart, either um, a trivial dose for most people that was one milligram body weight adjusted versus 22 milligrams. We did make a, a slight dose adjustment at the, after the first very few participants that ended up looking like it didn't make a difference. So I won't get into that complexity any more than that. But the basic design was everyone had screening, and then they went into their high dose session. Let's see if my cursor shows up. I don't think it does. It's fine. Session one, they either randomized to either had the high dose session first or the low dose session first. And then five weeks later, they had, we had a follow-up to see their depression and anxiety symptoms. And then there was the so-called crossover. Whatever condition you ha didn't have the first time, you get it now. So high dose to low dose, low dose to high dose. And then five weeks later, we assessed the symptoms. And then we had a long-term follow-up at six months. And like all of the other research I'm going to show you, there were no serious adverse events attributable to psilocybin. That's good to know. And here is our, our gold uh, standard depression uh, inventory, the Hamilton um, uh, depression inventory and the Hamilton anxiety inventory. And what you're seeing in both graphs is on the, left, on the leftmost point at baseline, you see very high levels. Trust me, this is in the clinically severe range for depression and anxiety. The different colors, blue and red, represents the two randomized groups. So low dose first, high dose later, or vice versa. So they start out at the same place. That's very good. After the first session, that's five weeks after that first session, the people that had the high dose, the people in red, saw a dramatic reduction into the non-clinical realm. These people, you know, this is a, 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 a low enough score, you, they would not qualify for any disorder at this point. Now, we also saw some substantial decreases in the low dose first group, and this is probably um, a result of both the rapport building, the so-called expectancy or placebo effect, the really tight therapeutic alliance, but nonetheless, um, significantly not nearly as much as the high-dose group. And then we have five weeks later in the post two. So this is after everyone has had both sessions. So everyone's had their high-dose session either five weeks ago or 10 weeks ago. And now everyone is down to that very low level of depression and anxiety. Um, and I should tell you, the, like the low dose, I don't know if I mentioned, it really was designed to just be a trivial dose with virtually no pharmacological effect. It was really to control for expectancy, to, to truthfully tell people every session will be psilocybin. We didn't say one's going to be high and one's going to be trivial. We said both could be high, you know, one could be high, one could be trivial, one could be high, one could be medium, et cetera. We kept them on their toes. Um, but the truth was embedded within the range that we gave them, importantly. Um, but these were, so it's just, we saw these, these reductions in depression and anxiety six months later that like, they were statistically nearly identical. So this is just unprecedented in the history of psychiatry. We've heard a bit about ketamine today, which is, has been um, legitimately considered a breakthrough in immediate treatment of depression, and its effects last you know, one, maybe a few more weeks. Um, here we're seeing effects last up to six months, and to be clear, it's not that we saw them go increase after six months, that's just the longest we've looked. So if ketamine is a breakthrough, get ready. Um, we've got to follow the data, but this is poised to, I think, to, to really have transformative effects in mental health treatment. 
And then again, like the healthy normals, we saw that the mystical experience was correlated with therapeutic effects. So the higher mystical experience, uh, the, the greater the reduction in both depression and anxiety symptoms. And that was a significant correlation. And uh, so similar findings with the two uh, cancer studies I mentioned. Um, and also the, the, the study that was published around the same time by the Imperial College Group in London in, in patients without cancer with depression, um, an open label study that saw similar um, large decreases in depression symptoms. And then not published yet, but here's some hot off the press analyses from our lab. We're doing a randomized waitlist control group where the the randomization is whether it's open label, but you just, you're told you're randomized to either get the treatment now or to wait a while and get the treatment later. And you could see that after the first session where the, group, the black bar group got the treatment, you see dramatic decreases in depression scores. And then the other group is stable, so it's not just the passage of time that uh, seems to be uh, causing an effect. Once those people then get the psilocybin session uh, several weeks down the road, you see a similar reduction. So all of these data are holding up um, uh, similar to what's been published. Similar, you know, along the theme of depression, um, there's this issue of, of suicidality, which of course is a, a product of depression. If you asked your person on the street the association between psychedelics and suicidal tendencies, they would, people would say that psychedelics <coughs> increase suicidality. But some work that I helped um, my colleague Peter Hendricks with, he's at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and he's doing some work uh, using psilocybin to treat cocaine addiction. This analysis, based on um, nearly 200,000 people in a large government survey of drug use and health, uh, we found that psychedelic users were actually statistically less likely to contemplate and attempt suicide. So this is naturalistic use, people just reporting having ever used a psychedelic in their lifetime after controlling for all of the relevant other variables we could statistically. And we found that it was true for psilocybin specifically in addition to the broader class of, of classic psychedelics. Now we can't show definitively that that's causal. Um, it could be the other factors drove, there was a common predisposition, but it's certainly suggestive and it's consistent with both um, our laboratory data and the many anecdotes of people claiming that you know, sometimes they just took these things to party and they had um, powerful therapeutic effects. And one of the, the real censures in that study that got my attention was that every other class of drugs looked at in terms of um, outcomes. So here I'm showing you past month psychological distress every other drug tended to be associated with, almost every other drug was associated with an increase in past month psychological distress. So it was really psychedelics that were the outlier. So now I'll move into addiction treatment. So I've already told you no one's jonesing for their next uh, classic psychedelic fix, but why in the world would you actually think they could be used to treat addiction? Well, there's several threads of evidence. One is from that older era of research from the 1950s through the early 70s um, using LSD largely to treat alcoholism. And uh, some Norwegian researchers several years ago published a meta-analysis of just the, the six randomized studies that randomize people to either LSD or some other comparison condition. And even though uh, a good number of these studies were not statistically significant when they were originally done and they had small sample sizes, in aggregate, they showed a very clear signal of LSD nearly doubling the odds that alcoholic patients would be improved at the first follow-up. And meta-analysis is basically a way to get studies that use different measures that got it generally the same construct to kind of speak the same statistical language. So this is a very large effect and rivals anything that we have available today for alcoholism. And I, I will also say before I move on that there was one study conducted in, in Baltimore using LSD to treat heroin addicted folks that showed promising effects. So there already seem, seemed to be this kind of signal of cross-drug anti-addiction efficacy which um, differs from most of addiction psychiatry. 
And then there's this thread of ceremonial use of psychedelics being associated with addiction recovery. So there are um, anthropological reports from both the uh, peyote use by the Native American church and ayahuasca ceremonies from South America and South American syncretic religions um, with reports of addiction recovery to various substances after um, psychedelic use. But by itself, I should say, you know, religious involvement itself can be associated with addiction recovery. So, but it's suggestive, consistent with those older studies. So I thought, okay, if it seems like this could work for different drugs, let's test smoking. This had never been done before. But if you really dig, you'll find some reports like the underground therapist Leo Zeff, the so-called secret chief. Um, if you read that book, he reported back in the 60s, it, actually, it might have been the 50s even, that on an LSD session, he just quit smoking, like why the hell am I doing this? And it was the last cigarette that he ever smoked. So I wanted to test the waters. It's, it, it was something at the time I had a good amount of research extending all the way back to graduate school, um, looking at um, uh, cigarette smoking and, sp and tobacco addiction. So we wanted to, this was a small study with 15 people to test the feasibility and safety. And aside from being like a good model system of addiction, it's easily biologically verifiable, get a urine sample, have them blow through a machine. Um, it's also kind of an issue itself, like uh, in terms of deaths, it swamped every other drug, including alcohol combined. Uh, the illicit drugs barely show up when you put them on the same graph. Nearly a half million people in the US a year worldwide, that's anywhere from two to three million people. I'm sorry, five million people across the world, it's estimated, die every year from smoking uh, illnesses. And if it was just people you know, undertaking this risk and being something they enjoyed and wanted to do, I wouldn't personally be interested. But the fact is that a lot of smokers, over two thirds in the United States, want to quit. And so leveraging this to be a tool to empower people to achieve a goal for something that causes so much harm seems like a really worthy goal. So the study got lots of press. Uh, we always appreciate that. And to be clear, if you haven't, you know, I haven't said it explicitly yet, I think you've gotten the theme though, there are risks. We're de you definitely don't use our research to, you know, we're not encouraging your use at home. Uh, but I have to just like particularly emphasize this. Definitely don't eat that many mushrooms. <laughs> like, that's a lot of mushrooms. That's a lot of mushrooms. So, just. So, the demographics, the important points here, they, they had been smoking over 30 years. They smoked about a half a day. These were not lightweights, these were real smokers, multiple previous quit attempts. It was a 15 week protocol. We combined it with cognitive behavioral therapy a standard backdrop to most smoking cessation programs. We had three psilocybin sessions over an eight week period, going from a moderate to a high dose, um, moderate in the first uh, session, and then a higher dose, but we could adjust that depending on response to the first session. And the first psilocybin session was on their target quit date. So there was this date that we set several weeks ahead of time with the participant where they were gonna quit smoking, and have a really big uh, dose of psilocybin. So it was a big day for people. <laughs> there were no serious adverse events due to psilocybin. Here's one of our biological metrics of smoking cessation, breath carbon monoxide. It's a byproduct of smoking, very reliable. That horizontal dashed line separates, you know, uh, it's a threshold between whether you've been smoking recently or not. We have across the x-axis at the bottom our study visits. Um, and the psilocybin session or target quit date is the vertical blue dotted line. And this is before psilocybin and that's after psilocybin. And I tell, you know, trainees, like this is what you learn in grad school, you don't really need statistics <laughs> to tell you that you have a pre-post difference here. So in terms of very long term, we, we followed these people out to two and a half years or 30 months. Uh, that was the average length that had been at that length of that follow up. And so what this equated to was that at six months, 80% or 12 out of the 15 people were biologically verified, both urine and breath, as being smoke free. And that held up at, at two and a half years to, at 60%. 
Those are very high quit rates, and I was you know, very cautious about this. It's open label, we can't demonstrate causality. But my other, my colleagues, there's my colleagues in the smoking area kept saying, yeah, but I've never seen 15 people in a row with you know, success rates that high. And just to give you a flavor of why we were so excited, it's not really a fair comparison because we're going across different studies, different techniques, different people. Nonetheless, just to give you some ballpark idea, our results are on the right at six months, you know, whether they're smoke free, compared to the best treatments out there, including the best medication, Varenicline or Chantix. So extremely high success rates. And, and so open label, meaning we can't demonstrate causality, the best, we can, the best question we can answer, is this worthy of follow-up? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. <laughs> and again, we found greater mystical experience in those, greater success in quitting smoking in those who had mystical experience. It was co significantly correlated with craving reduction. You're probably seeing a theme here with mystical experience. We published a qualitative analysis, so structured interviews with people long term. This was two and a half years later on average. And for pe when people said that, we said if psilocybin helped you quit, how, did it, how do you think it helped you? And so the themes that emerge across participants, and all of these were endorsed by multiple participants. Um, it provided a persisting sense of interconnectedness, awe, and curiosity that was helpful for quitting. It reduced smoking withdrawal symptoms compared to previous attempts. Psilocybin was perceived as not at all addictive, that falls in the duh category, and other positive changes, increases in altruism, appreciation for aesthetics such as art. Um, I remember one lady said, like, I haven't written poetry since I was in college. Like, why in the world am I not writing poetry? It's just, you know, it had been 20 or 30 years. Um, insights into self-identity and reason, reasons for smoking that were personal for them. So I kept hearing these stories and I'd present these data, like people sometimes pretty quietly would come up and say, hey, like this happened to me, you know? Um, sometimes like a year ago, sometimes like 30 years ago. And so we decided, let's launch a survey and just kind of collect these stories. And we found uh, uh, 1,100 people who claimed that they had, had either quit or reduced smoking as a result of a psychedelic experience. And the most meaningful thing from that, I mean, we're really just describing the landscape. This is one of those studies that can't demonstrate causality. But one of the things that jumped out at me was we asked them with a laundry list of withdrawal symptoms, how did it compare with the, with you know, with the psychedelic compared to other times when you have tried to quit smoking, if you've tried to quit smoking before. And it really popped out that for most of the, the kind of the bodily withdrawal symptoms, people said the modal response was, eh, about the same. But then when you get down to what you can call the mood or affective symptoms, anxiety, restlessness, depression, irritability, craving, they said the modal response was not just less severe, but much less severe. I think what we're seeing here is a potential connection between these anti-addiction effects and the antidepressant effects that we've seen in cancer patients and non-cancer patients. So even though we didn't require it, the internet survey, one person was able to figure out how to send in a selfie to us, the last cigarette she ever smoked. And so this is weird. We didn't ask for it again. Um, but uh, it was weird. This person said it was at a party, was just looking to party. But this cat said, I had a photo of myself, and, you know, the last cigarette I ever smoked after I ate a quarter ounce of mushrooms. So here's that cat. <laughs> Full-blown mystical experience. You could see it all in the pupils. It looks like a quarter ounce effect. So all of this is just, including the selfie, has justified our current randomized comparative efficacy trial funded by the Hefter Research Institute. We have, uh, we're running 80 treatment resistant smokers. Um, uh, people are randomized to psilocybin or nicotine patch. It's the same cognitive behavioral therapy um, as we used in our pilot study. We scaled down to one psilocybin session, not because we think one is better than multiple. Ultimately, I think more sessions is better for this. But for more experimental reasons, we're doing fMRI brain imaging before and after to see what biological changes, and also long term, to see what biological changes might correlate with success. So experimentally, it, it made sense to scale it down to one session. 
And here are our, our current success rates. So a different number of people have gotten to the, lar the longer follow-ups because they're still trickling through the studies. But for the 25 folks that have gotten to 12 months, we have 47% biologically verified as abstinent in the psilocybin group, 20% in nicotine reduction. And at six months, that's 50 versus 32. These are still very large effects. And again, only with one session, psilocybin session this time. So we're still extremely encouraged in our thinking about our next steps um, in expanding this into even larger work that could pave the way towards um, potential medical approval. I'll show you very briefly some neurocognitive data and fMRI data from this trial. This is from the so-called MSIT or multi-source interference task. Sometimes it's called the oddball task. It's kind of like the Strupa task if you're familiar with that. And it, 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 uh, the, the task is one of the numbers is going to be different than the other two numbers on the screen. So on the left, you see the one is different than the two zeros. And on the right, the one is different than the two twos. So you have to identify that number. But you have to identify it by using the corresponding, if it's a one, then you have to use the number one finger. And what everyone, all of our natural tendency is to use the finger that's in the same spatial location as that digit. And so sometimes these are the same thing as in the left example. There's no conflict between those two things. But in the right example, people are like, Ugh, they want to do something else, and they have to override that prepotent response. So they sort of get tripped up, uh, no pun intended, pun intended. But um, <laughs> they have to kind of exert more executive control over this decision and kind of um, have, yeah, have more executive authority over um, what their conscious decision is. And so it's the difference in reaction time between those two trials is how we quantify it. So the psilocybin group compared to the nicotine patch group shows less cognitive interference on this measure the day after quitting, um, substantially so in our current sample. Um, and then we see a normalization of, 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 the, task of the task associated fMRI, fMRI response in the right lingual gyrus the day after quitting. Uh, for the psilocybin group that we don't see in the nicotine patch group. So what might be going on here is sort of, you know, we'll see if the story holds up, but what I think this might be giving us a clue into is sort of this um, ability to hold a mindfulness perspective uh, the days after psilocybin. One of our participants who happened to be a pediatric surgeon put it this way. He said, you know, before when I got a craving, my hand just went in my pocket, got the cigarette, or if I didn't have any, I just sort of automatically pull into a, a convenience store. We call that automaticity in the, in the smoking cessation research world. It's like you're kind of on autopilot to a certain degree. He said, now it's like I'm Neo in the movie The Matrix, <laughs> where I'm in that slow motion world. It's like, OK, a craving's coming. I see it a mile away. But guess what? I quit last week. No big deal. It's going to pass in a few minutes. I'm just going to step out of the way, <laughs> and it just flies by. I mean, maybe that's what we're seeing in this task, like this greater executive control, if you will, a more conscious control over the motivations that drive your behavior. Um, so in, in Part of the excitement is that we're seeing you know, treatment across so many of these disorders, including addictive disorders. So I'm showing you briefly data from my colleague Mike Bogenschutz at New York University. Very similar to our smoking pilot, where he saw dramatic reductions in drinking days and heavy drinking days with the administration of a high dose of psilocybin. Um, and these were people with alcohol use disorder, alcoholism. And we have uh, done some work consistent with that. We recently published a survey study like the smoking study I told you about where people said, yeah, I just quit drinking or I substantially reduced my drinking because of a psychedelic session. So we found 343 people with those types of stories. 83% of those no longer qualified of having even a minimal alcohol use disorder. Um, and it's pretty easy to qualify for at least having the mild alcohol use disorder under the current DSM. And we ran a, a structural equation modeling. It's kind of a fancy way to tell you how the, all the variables are related to each other. Essentially what it suggests is that the dose of the, of, of the psychedelic um, 
had an influence on how insightful the experience was and also how mystical, uh, as defined before, it was. Both of those fed into how personally meaningful it was, and then that was responsible for the reduction in alcohol use problems. So the big picture is why in the world is a similar intervention affecting all these nominally different disorders? I mean, addictions across different drugs and then like depression and anxiety in cancer patients and non-cancer patients, like what's going on here? It should make people skeptical as a, you know, it sounds like snake oil. How could it do all of that? Well, I think it encourages, encourages us to look at common mechanisms. So I think of the, all of these disorders as, as sort of addiction broadly defined, whether that's to a substance or a certain way of thinking about yourself or thinking about your relationship to the world, a narrowing of the behavioral and mental repertoire. And it may be based on acute effects. Um, it may be supported by overly uh, rigid brain network dynamics. So in our current smoking study, we're going to be looking to whether there were those, and you've heard about these today, whether some of those changes in the way that the brain area is synchronized with each other, whether there's, whether there's long lasting changes in those types of measures that are um, correlated with treatment success. We don't have an answer to that now, but several groups are actually pursuing that question. Um, and I think most broadly, outside of you know, therapeutics of psychedelics themselves, I think it's, this research is pointing uh, it's very powerful in answering a question about what the endogenous role of serotonin 2A receptors, you know, what this role is. And, and Dave discussed some of this before. One way of speculating about this is that they're maybe modulating at a very high level mental and behavioral plasticity, which is a, a sort of a high level of, of learning, if you will. So Michael Pollan, in his book, credited me with a not very scientific sounding <laughs> like na name, and I, gu I guess I did say this, it sounds like something I'd say, but the dope slap effect. <laughs> so he says, Johnson believes that psychedelics can be used to change all sorts of behavior, not just addiction. The key in his view is their power to occasion a sufficiently dramatic experience to dope slap people out of their story. Psychedelics open a window of mental flexibility in which people can let go of the mental models we use to organize reality. So we have a lot of work to do to figure out how that like really poor, you know, vague description, whether that there's a reality to that, but my hunch is there's something like that going on. So I guess, uh, yeah, I'm still under 50 minutes. I'll just thank by reiterating my thanks to a large number of great individuals that have contributed to this. Thank you. And I'm a nerd, so I, I see that I'm at, a, at about 47 minutes since I've started talking. So unless I'm cut off, I, I guess I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Ten minutes for questions. Oh, cool. Oh, man, that's a long time. Now I'm really sweating. <laughs> be, be merciful on me. I, th I think I saw you in the white shirt. I think I saw you first. So you mentioned smoking is kind of the background. Of course, you're looking at psychedelics and smoking, and in the brain, the smoking is very important. But also, of course, the lungs and the respiratory system. Um, and there's been some research people like what they do with potential anti-inflammatory agents. Do you see any, I guess, improvements in the lung performance outside of the fact that they stop smoking, or I guess, how do they compare to other people that go smoking? The short answer is no, we haven't looked at. We, we, so far, we have such a small sample to look at it. And, and any, like, any time you quit smoking, you're going to have dramatic improvements in lung function. So I even think looking in our current trial between nicotine patch and psilocybin that any differential effect through reductions in inflammation would just be completely overshadowed by the fact that they've all, like any successful person who has quit has quit smoking. But that's, a, that's an interesting thing to look at. Certainly the, the, the stuff that Chuck Nichols has shown with um, anti-inflammatory effects is, is very promising and may may hold potential for, it may be a mechanism for treatment of psychiatric disorders, but also for non-psychiatric medical disorders involving inflammation. Um, I have no ability to determine who was first. I'll just, yeah. Um, well, this morning, I noticed, uh, I attended another conference earlier in May in Madison, Wisconsin, 
And I've noticed that um, in people in your realm and doing studies, you are purposely shying away from the LSD word. <laughs> Can you explain that? I would love to do LSD research. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think after 20 years of say, I think initially that was a very wise move. I mean, one of the advantages to psilocybin at the beginning was frankly, like no one knows how to spell it, like including me, I spell it wrong half the time. Importantly, you don't spell it LSD. I mean, that was the thing that you know, scared the shit out of the establishment in the late 60s, early 60s. 70s and and you know mushrooms at that time was something of a friend of a friend went to the mountains of Mexico to do it wasn't until the mid 70s folks realized oh it's growing all over cow fields in the southeast and in the northwest so you know back in the day you know in the psychedelic heyday it was it was LSD and so you know pharmacologically it still has the best safety track record there's there were far more early studies and it's robustly somatic everything we know about the somatic safety nothing is safe period but these drugs psilocybin and LSD are remarkably safe at the in terms of you know the potential to cause organ damage or acute lethality um, it's it, and so um, yeah, I think we, we're 20 years into psilocybin research now, and I think it's time we, we, we look at LSD. It may be that you get, get an even better treatment response with LSD for some of these disorders. Right, so yeah, LSD, uh, is going to be a long day on the, on the part of the, <laughs> right, and so there's different ways to address that, 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 that I've thought about, you know, one, you could have treatment teams where you kind of have, you know, some overlap, but then kind of a tag team approach and you hold on to the person a while, but, but the, yeah, but there might actually be an advantage. Sometimes you get to like hour four, hour, you know, you're at four and a half hours and, and you always tell the person like, don't worry, just take every present moment for what it is and, and accept it. And they're at the end of the session, towards the end, and they say, oh gosh, they've just kind of gotten through rough waters and now kind of this beautiful experience is unfolding and they're thinking, I'm afraid it's gonna end. You're like, oh, don't worry about that. And then the therapists are thinking, oh God, I hope this you know, doesn't end. <laughs> so it's like at that point with LSD, it's like, all right, man, we got another like five or six hours. <laughs> and so, I do think one of the reasons I mentioned earlier that three sessions is probably better than one is I, I call it the slot machine effect. Sometimes you just get a dud. These are highly variable sessions. I've had people in that smoking cessation pilot that they had a really weird first session and then they had one of the most meaningful experiences of their life on the second session. So you're just increasing your probability of one of these meaningful sessions and I don't think it's washed out by having a dud thrown into the mix. So you're just increasing your chances of one of these experiences that our data suggest are associated with long-term positive outcome. In the same spirit, I think the same thing will happen by just having a 12-hour session versus a six-hour session by using LSD. So that might be one reason that it could be more helpful. But it's all an empirical question. This is really largely speculation on my part. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Is there any study done which, uh, which shows the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia? How does it affect that? Any study in the realm where there is already some hallucinations or delusions or negative symptoms? How does it, how does it modify that? So, um, well, we have, a, and the other research groups, thankfully, in the modern era, have avoided, you know, folks with, with any psychotic, you know, pre psychotic predisposition. Something very relevant, though, is some research suggests that in terms of modeling the symptoms of psychosis, that the classic psychedelics like psilocybin tend to more model the positive symptoms of, of psychosis. And that means the presence of symptoms that shouldn't be there, like hallucinations um, or delusional thoughts and that the negative symptoms of psychedelics are better modeled by the NMDA antagonists like ketamine. So negative symptoms would be the absence of something that should be there. So catatonia is an example. You should be moving and you're, you're, you're frozen. Um, so yeah, we, yeah, we don't yeah, really know. Um, 
No, and, 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 and I think we, we know enough so that we should, not, that we should exclude um, you know, people with a reasonable, with an identifiable predisposition for psychotic disorders. I mean, there was never any studies that said, oh, let's take you know, uh, 30 pre-morbidly psychotic people and give half of them a high dose of LSD and half of them not and then track. You know, and I think we, there's enough anecdotes of people that, that, that it seemed like their first break happened with a psychedelic experience that it probably played a causal role. Whether that break would have ever happened, whether it, whether it would have happened later, we don't know. But it's, it, it seems very plausible that it played a causal role. And a lot of, I mean, it's terribly complex because the first typical psychedelic experience, you know, happens adolescence, early 20s. When does the first psychotic break happen? Adolescence, early 20s. So, um, yeah, there, I'm not, I'm not going to say that there's never, you know, some potential once we learn a lot more to very cautiously see if there's any ability to, to treat psychotic disorders. There are some anecdotes of, in that realm, but gosh, we'd have to be, let's wait and like that, we should be very careful in pursuing anything like that. Um, yes. What's your experience been like with the peer review process? Are there um, reviewers who are possible? Are there journals that just need to be the editors when it comes to publishing this type of work? Yeah, I think it's come along. It's funny now. It's like uh, I have a good colleague on the editorial board for one journal, and uh, he was asking for ideas for special issues. And I said, I have an idea. How about not doing a special issue on psychedelics? Because everyone's doing it now. <laughs> um, so it's become quite quite the fad to do special issues on this, so that's one proxy of kind of an increased acceptance and interest in peer review. Um, and by the way, these happen to be like well-cited papers, so if people, if you're a young scientist and like folks tell you about the risks, you know, of getting into this field, like there's some upsides too, like that's, you know, good academic credit being involved with some work that's highly cited. But the, the it, it's, I think it's improved over the years. When we first submitted our so-called safety paper uh, that was published in 2008. It was eventually published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology, where David Nutt is the editor. And David Nutt, of course, is, in, is started the Imperial College Psychedelic Group, and he's been open to this research for a long time. But I won't name the other journal that I initially sent it to, very respected journal in the psychopharmacology area, that, you know, respected reviewers that just said, well, what's different here? Like, yeah, you got to you got to screen your participants, but you know, doing studies, how is this different than doing studies with amphetamine or alcohol or uh, cocaine? And I've done studies with all of those drugs, methamphetamine and cocaine, where we've given people these various drugs, and it's a lot different. You know, every drug you need to know your risk, you know, give an opioid, you better monitor their breathing, give, you know, uh, you know a stimulant, better monitor their heart. Well. It's a little, it's even harder to do than those cases, but you give someone a psychedelic, a high dose, and you really have to monitor their psychological well-being and screen them at the beginning in a much more rigorous way. So there wasn't this appreciation for, you know, the idea that this is really something different and we kind of, we could use, you know, a review of, of guidelines for shaping that. So I think it's coming along and there's like a lot of interest now and we usually get a, we usually get a fair shake these, I mean, I don't know, you always gripe, like, there's always paper rejections, and you always get reviewer three, you know, <laughs> makes you want to pull your hair out, but, yeah, I don't think it's particularly bad now. Um, yeah. This will be the last one. Okay, last one, sorry. So, uh, based on the experience with uh, DPT, one of Shulkin's compounds, found a very uh, useful, I could see its anti-anxiety properties at work. I kind of marvel in that regard and wonder now whether within your community there is any related discussion about the therapeutic value of DDT. Um, you know, I haven't heard a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm certainly familiar, it was used by the Spring Grove group in, in treatment of cancer patients. It was one of the few classic psychedelics used in the older era, but frankly I haven't heard a lot of interest in returning to DPT. Um, yeah, and I think that was administered intramuscularly um, in that published research. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the co exciting thing is, like, we have a whole library of compounds, and there are very few that have actually been, anything that's been given in humans before, there's a better case to be made that we don't need to do potentially millions of dollars of worth of animal toxicology to get into humans. Um, so, actually, DPT is a pretty interesting candidate, um, thinking about it that way, given that there was some older human research with it. But, I mean, the, the data suggests it provides the full range of the effects that we're talking about. So, yeah. Um, so, I'm told that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.